Welcome everyone to this uh, Trinity P3 webinar, how your independent agency can get a head start on landing major clients. My name is Darren Woolley, the global CEO of Trinity P3, and thank you for making the time to join us today. Before we get started, I just want to take you through some uh, housekeeping. First, thank you for joining us. We're going to be strictly to one hour, so we'll finish at uh, 17.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. We're going to have a Q&A session towards the end, but we'd encourage you to ask your questions on the way through using the Q&A function. We're also going to be recording this session for future use, and you will receive an email in the next 24 hours with a link to the recording. So with that, I'd like to then introduce you to our two presenters today. Um, we've had a previous webinar with Susan and Peter, which was introducing the concept of independent, small independent agencies and how they can uh, pitch to and win corporate business. And it was very successful. Today, uh, we'll be hearing from some of the agencies who have taken that opportunity and working with them. So first of all, I'd like to um, introduce you to Susan Workner uh, from the Agency Accelerators and Peter Applebaum, both co-founders of the Agency Accelerators. Welcome to both of you. Thank you, Darren. We're happy to uh, have the panel today. Yeah, thank you very much, Darren. So, look, as, as we mentioned, welcome everyone to the webinar. As I say, it's, 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 it's exactly three months to the day since we did our first webinar with, uh, with Trinity P3. And as Darren said, it was very successful. And what was became very, very clear from during the webinar and, and certainly after it as well is that, is that business development and creating consistent opportunities for independent agencies is very much an in-demand topic. And that's why um, Darren has asked us back three months later and, and we've, uh, he's also said, why don't we, rather than Susan and I doing all the talking again, why don't we ask three of our clients with whom we've been working over the last two or three months to see what they have to say and to see what their experiences are. And, and basically, obviously, very much keeping in mind what, the, what you are interested in and that is obviously how you can get more opportunities and, and, and make more money via major clients. So next slide, please. So look, just to, you're probably wondering very briefly, who the hell are we, if you don't know us? Um, this is just a very small snapshot of the, the corporate clients, if we could go back. Um, just, just a very small snapshot of the corporate clients that Susan and I have brought in over the years working for other independent agencies and our own agencies over the years. So um, we are not talking out of theory. We certainly know um, what it takes. We've, we've, uh, I, we often say to our clients, um, we, are, we want you as our clients to avoid the potholes because we've pretty much fallen into each and every one of them and we've learned a lot along the way. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And this is probably one of the most key and amazing slides and, and piece of research that we've found when it comes to, to agencies. And this is not just independent agencies, but less than 10% of all agencies, and that's not just creative, that's media, PR, experiential, digital, of course, um, they implement any type of predictable business development system to build revenue. And that's an incredibly challenging position to be in. We, we, won't, go into, we won't go into the, the challenges that, that arise as a result of that. We're all, I think many of us who are on this webinar um, have lived it, and that is lumpy cash flow, unpredictable um, security of the business. Uh, you, if you lose one or two big clients, it can mean incredibly dangerous times for the agency. So we're working with our clients to ensure that all of those problems go away. Obviously, business development is never easy. It is a numbers game, but we always say it's a strategic numbers game. We'll get into that in a little bit. So really what this webinar is all about is actually having a conversation with, as Darren mentioned, three of our wonderful clients. And if you go to the next slide, please. And just to introduce you to them, and we've, we've looked, I, I guess the, the good fortune we have here today for, for you who are viewing the, the uh, webinar is that we're, we've put together three very different organizations, very different people, obviously, um, and it, it's going to make it, I think, a very interesting webinar as a result. So firstly, Jacques and Nicola Erasmus from Idea Foundry, they're locked down in South Africa, and that has its own challenges, of course, but a lot of their business is done in Southeast Asia. And we'll talk about um, how, they're, how they're dealing with that. 
um, and how, how they're moving their agency forward in these challenging times. Carolyn Stebbing from Little Village Creative is based also in a lockdown in situation in Melbourne, Australia. And John Chan Burt from Burge Farrell International, and he has an APAC remit, and he's recently started Burge Farrell. Ironically, John uh, used to be on the poacher turned gamekeeper or the other way around. He used to be on the client side, um, loved working with the agency so much that he decided to come here and start the, the APAC division of Burge Farrell. So if you would join me in welcoming them, I think, uh, as I say, there's their, their experience, their background, and certainly their experiences over the last two or three months, I think, will make it uh, for very interesting type of thing. So if we could turn off the, the, the video and go to our, our guests. So firstly, Jacques and Nicola, if we could ask yeah. them. Hello. Good morning and thank you for Good waking morning. up so early. Um, as I say, they're locked down in, in sunny South Africa. So to that point, it, you've got a very, I guess, a unique situation that you're running an independent agency. You're currently in South Africa, but you're looking, you've got a footprint in Southeast Asia. Um, is that less of is geography less of an issue now than it was pre-COVID? Um, it has. It's become very much less of a, a, a challenge because um, I think we're all experiencing the same thing. We've all gone through some form of a lockdown. Um, and when you're working with clients and you can't really get to their offices, you've got to kind of call in via Zoom. So um, it's kind of the same thing. So whether we're sitting in South Africa, whether we're sitting in Bangkok or in Yangon, Myanmar, or in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, or even in Singapore, um, it has become a lot less of a problem for us. Um, it's never been a problem for us, but it's become a lot less of a problem for, 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 for clients who um, who's always looking for somebody in market, I think. Um, and they're going, well, do you, have a, do you have an office in the market? And we tend to go, no, we don't. Um, but it's also because of the way we initially set up, set up our business to run a lot more uh, decentralized, I guess, by job. It's definitely become a lot less of a problem now. So you, th you feel clients who once may have said, oh, if you don't have an office in Singapore, for example, we're not interested in speaking to you. Do you feel that that will become much less of a problem? Oh yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, for sure. They always want us to be in country, but uh, for now, uh, it's actually better because now we can say, okay, we can still do the work for you. We still can do it, but we just uh, do it via Zoom or, you know, have our meetings via Zoom. Um, we still produce the same quality of work, even though we're not in country. So I like, I like to call that the new normal. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, which is our old normal. <laughs> yeah. You're, ahead You're ahead of the curve. Yeah. <laughs> And I think, and Carolyn, I think you're similar in that you you also have been using um, basically, uh, I guess, not necessarily employees in house. So you have a, a cohort of of um, you know contractors and others that you work with, I suppose. So how does that work for you? It must be an advantage for you too. Yeah, well, I think our whole our whole business model has always been uh, very much. Um, you know, geared around that whole idea of being flexible and being in, in the cloud. So we've pretty much, you know, Little Village is pretty much being in, operating in the cloud since day one. And I think probably five years ago when we started this idea of having a disparate workforce elsewhere was a little bit strange for certain clients, but there were a few clients that could see the beauty in that. Um, five years on, that's very normal. And I think that's being embraced. So I, I definitely hear where Jacques and Nicola are coming from on that yeah increased opportunities i reckon yeah. mm. Mm. and john obviously as a as a relatively new player in the market <clears throat> excuse me obviously you've been putting a lot of the strategic business development foundations in place such as setting objectives identifying the target markets your messaging and tonality and, and knowing the answer to why us i mean i guess that's a that's a bit of a challenge, but obviously something you've embraced as, as a, a new, newborn entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so even in my corporate career where I spent you know, 20 years before getting into this side of the world, I'd never sold anything to anyone uh, before. So, you know, all of this kind of stuff is brand new and, and certainly as um, the owner and, and main operator of an agency or any business, you know, part of your, your job is really to do the selling and raise the profile of the business. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's, it's something that's new, something that is, um, I've embraced, something that I've 
I've taken the mindset of failing forward, yeah. So making mistakes along the way, but uh, mm. trying to minimise them as you go along and try not making them again. Um, and certainly, sort of value in engaging with people who have done it all before um, and acknowledging that I'm not the expert. Um, and but but learning along the way, um, it's been an enlightening journey thus far. Um, and but and and only happy things to report at the moment. And do you find that um, obviously having been on the client side, it, it gives you a very different perspective on, on what clients need? Do you have a greater understanding? Because you were obviously working for corporate clients on the client side. Does that yeah. give you an advantage, for example, when it comes to trying to attract corporate clients to your agency? Yeah, I think, I think certainly I know the mindset. Um, having been you know, in marketing for quite a few years and, and certainly dealing with agencies, I know now that you know even if I do get a lead, um, that if things aren't going according to timelines, it's not personal. It just means that you know I'm not necessarily a priority at the moment on the other side because there are existing relationships. I know that corporates are like big um, tankers, oil tankers, big ships. You know that aren't easy to turn around. You know there's there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of processes involved, um, and so just to be patient. You know. Um, and keep at it, uh, but and and certainly, you know, it's not personal. So if they ghost you, which happens often, um, you know, just just keep going. I didn't even know what that expression was for, for many many years, but it happened so often to me. So I guess that's yes. now I can put, put, a, put an expression to what they've been doing for years. That's just that's just part of the part of the game, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And tell me, I think with um, I think we, you know, with with all agencies, I think one of the questions I think a lot of agencies ask is how do you differentiate yourselves? Like, how do you make sure that you are seen as having sort of a unique positioning with um, you know, with prospects? I guess. So, what sort of ways have you helped to differentiate or looked at differentiating yourselves? Maybe Jacques and Nicola first. You want to have a chat? Um. Yeah. So. Uh, we we literally went through a rebrand. When was it? Early middle last year, because um, the current the, 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 the previous previous identity and positioning was quite quite old and stale, um, and the world's changing at such a rapid pace, and just COVID's just completely fast tracked it even more um, that we needed a new positioning, especially because our business is very has become very strategically focused. Um, in, in, in especially Asia, um, not so much in the African side or the South African side. Um, so it, 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 it ended up that we had to make the decision that we needed to, to kind of change our positioning um, to something that speaks more, more to the majority of the work that we do, um, which is on the strategic side. So um, it, it's helped a hell of a lot, I guess, in terms of being able to explain to a client as well at the end of the day what it is we do, um, so when you look at when, when you look at what how how we've positioned the business, um, there's a hell of a lot less explanation now to a client at the end of the day. They kind of look at our services and they completely understand what we do, why we do it, and where we do it from, and or how we do it as well. Um, that's yeah, it's kind of kind of kind kind of it. And I think Carolyn, you have a, a very, very interesting positioning. Why don't you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, that's that's been an interesting, interesting journey. Um, so, if I sort of look back, I, I started, as I said, I started Little Village Creative five years ago. I've, I'm a sole director business, so I'm I'm the only founder. And um, you know, I think being in my late twenties, I kind of just dived all in and went, you know what, well, I'm going to make this work. I'm just going to make this happen. And it was actually a great way to start. That's how you should start. You just sometimes have to roll up your sleeves and get stuck in. But I never really felt comfortable, because, you know, in terms of having a positioning. You know, we had, I had this agency, uh, for anyone, you know, who's sort of not familiar with the model, but this agency that was really made up of these incredibly uh, talented freelancers that I had in my network, um, rather than a sort of a set team. Um, I had this sort of this model and um, that was quite unknown or just not very common at the time. And I used to talk about us as being a little village of, of creatives, of course, uh, but, you know, we're a flexible team. We're creative problem solvers. And you sort of go, oh, creative problem solvers. I, I think just about every agency says that they're a creative problem solver these days. Uh, so uh, positioning had never really 
sort of resolved itself, I guess. And, you know, we're all creatives really here. We're creative thinkers. You, you don't just sit down and come up with a positioning. It probably comes to you in the shower when you're thinking about something else. You know, it really sort of has to marinate away. Um, but towards the end of last year, I decided that I would, the team and I would very much focus on that. I really wanted to hit 2020 with, you know, in a much stronger position than where we were um, after, you know, sort of a good few years of incremental growth. And that's where we move towards this positioning, um, which you guys actually helped us with, um, which is the chameleons of, your chameleons of creativity. And uh, we sort of, we, I think we were about 80% there, little village, um, before we met you, Susan and Peter, and you guys helped us get to that final, that final bit. So that's really the story of our positioning. Yeah, and I think it talks to something that was probably once a, a weakness or a perceived weakness in our business that's now become our strength. Yeah. Can I ask a question about that? Just a follow-up question to that, Carolyn, because sure. some people may be listening to this and saying, oh, positioning, we're, we're all the same. We're all, we're all yep. offering the same service. It's like with creative solutions, digital, PR, whatever. There's no such thing as a unique service. What would your yep. response to that be? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, you know, and I think it's much easier to differentiate yourself, differentiate differentiate yourself if you focus on one type of service if you're, you're a brand specialist or you build websites or you know you, you focus on pr same if you focus on an industry niche as well um but little village wasn't like that so you know we've got a variety of different clients and you know lots of different industries and we do lots of different things so rather than focus on the, the typical ways or typical things that might differentiate us i really wanted to focus on a mindset and the structure of the business that we have. So it, it look, it did take a while and it took a few people as well, um, but we got there okay. in the end. Yeah. And John just wanted to, as, as the, the, the former client on the panel, I think actually Susan and I were former clients <laughs> sometime, probably a little, little earlier than you. I guess one of the key questions that maybe a lot of the, the attendees are thinking is how can independents approach major clients? And I know you said, obviously, the, the corollary to that is you said you'd never sold really before um, in your corporate position. But now that you are on that side, how can you, firstly, do you feel that corporates are open to working with independent agencies? And secondly, how can we do it? Yeah, and I think, I think my answer is probably going to add richness to the previous discussion about differentiation. So uh, for context, Burger Farrell is a business that has existed for over 20 years and has got a variety of industry experience all along brand world and if you think about brand world there's brand strategy positioning to corporate and visual identity all the way to the rubber hits the road or the product hits the shelf from packaging design and things like that and so i think as certainly in the beginning um i and i'm sure i'm not alone i wanted to try and sell all of those things you know or any one of them because i was so desperate to get some business in um but in the last couple of months I've decided to I guess you know answer the question of what is the what is the tip of the spear that I can go in with to a client so that um, um, you know I get my first opportunities and for us you know that was packaging design um, for any consumer good really but if we had to narrow it down even more it's even it's for alcoholic beverages so so Carolyn talks about you know an, an industry specialization you know, that would be us and a certain capability um, You're in the right country, John. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and, and that was deliberate as well, you know, because, you know, once you, you know, there's a larger audience that I can appeal to. And then, you know, the law of averages says eventually if I speak to enough people, some one of them will speak to me. And then there's potentially an opportunity there. Um, and, you know, my experience is, is yes. Um, you, if you, if, because I went in with the specialization of what we're good at, even though we can do so many other things, uh, people were more than likely to return my calls or my emails or my LinkedIn requests and things like that because they wanted to see what a specialist had to say versus you know, a big global agency who would already promise them everything. Um, and so a great width of experience, but potentially not a great depth of experience because, as you know, when an agency pitches for work, uh, like a lucrative contract, they'll bring all the rock stars into the room and then potentially when they win the contract, the rock stars go away. And then, um, you know, those guys and their experience are not on the projects that they need. And so that's where our opportunity comes in because we have the, the depth of experience and 
along with all the other things um, that come with uh, independent agencies, um, like agility, you know, like being able to make decisions very quickly and not have to go speak to a head office somewhere. Um, and so, yeah, uh, certainly, you know, specialization and, and being very targeted um, has led me to a conversation or conversations with bigger, bigger organizations. And, and do you think, um, actually, Jack and Nicola, I, th I think one of the questions people always think about is how do we approach corporates? How can we actually engage with prospects that are bigger than us? Um, and I know that you actually, um, uh, the two of you ran a successful webinar, which I think helped you to make some contacts with some pretty large uh, corporate marketing um, marketing directors, I guess. So tell us a little bit about how you, how you managed to put a successful webinar on during uh, COVID. Um, well, we uh, created a webinar about COVID, I guess. Um, yeah, so we, we had a bit of a conversation with a couple of our clients um, in, in, in especially the Indo-Chinese region. And um, they've kind of indicated that they, kinda, they, they want to understand how do they manage COVID. And some of these countries are starting to open up. And how do they manage getting back to work and get marketing back up and running? Um, what are the trends they need to start watching out for and looking for at the end of the day? Um, so we, myself and my strategy director, we we came up with a um, with a webinar, um, and we developed certain content around some of the questions that we were being asked. Um, we came up with some trends. We looked at what's happening in the region from various other reports and articles. Um, and that's, that, that was fairly successful. I mean, we've um, landed a, a, a nice introduction to the Southeast Asia Regional Director for Coca-Cola uh, through that. Uh, we got a, quite a nice introduction to Tyson Krupp from Germany as well, uh, more locally for South Africa and Africa. Um, so it's, it, it's quite, it went quite well. I mean, you, 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 we, we had about, I think, about 35 people. We had 110, 112 people registered. Um, and we're still sending out stuff around and content out around the webinar. Uh, from ebooks that's now got lots of detail, a lot more detail to, to, um, to the conversation we had or the presentation we had, right through to um, some articles that also still deal with it that we've done. We've, done some, we've just done our second article around it. Um, and we're getting some good feedback on, on a lot of it, um, a lot of it from, from, from existing clients, um, but still some of, some, of, some of the people on the webinar that's come back and said, um, can you give me more information about X, Y, and Z, which is, which is great. Um, so yeah, so it's, I mean, the webinar has done, done really well and we've got, our second, we, we've got our second and third topic, we just need to schedule them um, and run them. Uh, so it's a great, it's a great opportunity, I think, for developing new business. And yeah, we're keeping in touch with by emails and or email email campaigns and things like that with with everybody that was registered on the webinar as well, whether they attended or not. Um, and it's just, it just it just keeps the relationship alive at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. And eventually, it takes a bit of time, like John said. And um, they don't all just come back to you after the webinar and say, well, we all want to work with you. It takes a bit of time. It sometimes takes a specific, very specific project on their side to mm -hmm. come back to you, I guess, at the end of the day, which I guess was also why Coca-Cola ended up speaking, speaking to us because they were looking for something innovate, something around in product innovation. Um, and it's the same with, we, we, with, with another beer brand we're working on as well. It's around innovation and, and, and innovation and activation um, and channel strategy, uh, which is pieces of work we do we're very good at doing. Um, so yeah, um, I think it's uh, I think it's a great way to go at the end of the day. Mm. And it's all about creating quality touch points, isn't it? And I think that uh, this is something we we're always talking about with our clients. And and Carolyn, I know that mindset is a very important is one of your specific passions. And I think I guess but having and, and this is the feedback we've got from Darren from a lot of independent agencies as well. Um, outside of our, our the scope of our client base, and that is, there is often a bit of a, a lack of belief that um, that you can actually that a, a big agency like a Unilever or a Nike or a Coca Cola would actually look at me. And I guess, what is your viewpoint on mindset and how critical that is to uh, to basically moving, getting yourself ready to get those big corporate clients? Oh, look, you know, my, mindset's incredibly important, and that was actually one of the the reasons I sought you and Susan out, Peter, as you know, um, because I felt that, you know, 
my team and I had done a lot, a lot, a lot of work on Little Village, getting it to a point where we had this, I think, quite compelling brand for an agency. I'm really proud of our brand and where you know how far it's come. Um, but it's that confidence of going, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not DDB, I'm not Sarchi's, but I do have something to offer, and I know we can add value to these clients, these bigger clients, because we have worked with them, sort of, albeit ad hoc in the past. How do we have that confidence? Um, so, you know, I think I remember saying to you and Susan before we kicked off, I said, that's one of the big things. Can you help? Can you help us with that and help me specifically as a founder? Um, you know, it's a pretty lonely journey, I think, as a sole owner. Um, and, you know, particularly being a, a woman, there's, you know, not many sole female agency directors out there. So sometimes we've just got to find those ways to to actually to, to grow our confidence and, and back ourselves a bit more. But, you know, a little bit of external help doesn't hurt either. You do you do need it, I think. Um we, we definitely yeah. doubt ourselves. <laughs> you, started the, you, you started the ID Foundry yourself, wasn't that right? First? Oh, did yeah, you? Did. Oh, yeah. 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 Many, many years ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw ten years ago. I had a lot of, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um no, very important. And John, I think for you as well, I know mindset was very important too, having um you know, come from, I guess, you've got an international design, you know, company working with, but obviously you want to try and track bigger clients. And obviously you don't have hot and cold running account executives. So I guess the mindset to go after bigger corporates is equally important for you. How did you find that shift? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Karen also mentioned it now, you know, this is, uh, it's a lonely journey. Um, if, if, certainly if you're the only employee, um, Yes, I've got some support from uh, the team in South Africa where we're based. Um, but, you know, I'm the only one that's on the ground here. Um, and certainly, you know, if you talk about minds, mindset shift, it's, it's, you know, this is really building something from the ground up on this side because the reputation from the business, which has worked with many big corporates before and, and, and iconic brands that people will recognize, doesn't really necessarily count for anything on this side. Um, and so while it can potentially get us and has gotten us into a conversation, it really is now about, well, what are you about um, um, on this side of the world? Do you understand this side of the world? And it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of work. Um, I think where that starts to pay off is when you start to see results. And that's very important. You need to celebrate the wins. Um, don't just always look at the things that it's so tough and, you know, you're getting so many rejections or, you know, you're not getting answers back, but you know, celebrate the wins because they are those along the way. Um, and again, you know, so for myself, you know, why I engaged you guys for help is because, <laughs> because I was really the only person here. Every time I came up with an idea, it was always a great idea because there was no one else um, to challenge me. Um, the boss, the boss really loved it, John. <laughs> the boss loved it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> I so I needed, I needed someone. Yeah. <laughs> No, it's yeah. exactly that. It's it's yeah. just, you know, it, it can't operate like this all the time. Um, and yeah, and just getting some some help from, from people um, that have done it before is, is really, really what I was looking for. I know that... I think... Uh, I think um, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Peter. I was just going to say, just building on what John was saying about mindset too, and sort of harking back to a conversation, Susan, that you and I had had was, you know, I think you have to also flip your own perception or question your own perception of selling, you know, as, a, as a, an independent agency owner. I, I mean, I personally love meeting people. I, I, I love networking. It's a horrible, it's a word that's tinged with a lot of, uh, you know, ill feeling, but I, I actually love meeting people and I genuinely love finding out about them and I love helping people. Yeah. So if you can see it and position and well, reposition your own thinking around, you know, I'm, I've got something to offer. I'm, at, you know, I've got, you know, I can, I can be friends. I mean, it's not friends in the typical sense, is it? But it's, you know, I can, I've yeah. got something of value I can offer here. Let's, let's build some sort of relationship. I think you're, you're on to, you're on to a winner because that's really how you need to think. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I, I, so if good. I, if I could just add to that, I think, um, and that's so true because, you know, we all, certainly in the last few months, I've been getting a lot of LinkedIn requests from people who in the 300 character space that they have to introduce themselves. They've used all of those characters to try and sell me whatever product they, they yeah. want to. And it's very confronting. Um, and I don't think that's, that's probably the right way. 
um, yeah. certainly for me, um, from an authentic perspective. And, you know, it's really about building relationships. It's, you know, it's about having that mindset that actually I can add value to you in the long term, over the long term, versus I'm in it to get one project from you and then we walk away and, you know, there's no long term value that's been created. Um, and, and just finding, finding that point, you know, um, and keep on going for that, that commonality that you have with the other person on the other side which is a human, um, um, and, and then really selling from there if, if, you, if you want. I actually have often spoken to Susan over the years and said maybe it's an overblown sense of my own um, benefits or strengths or whatever, and I've said it's like people who don't choose to work with us, I feel sorry for them. I really feel sorry for them because mm -hmm. I know the value that we can bring to the equation, to your point, John, that it's like it's, it's, there are so many people who, in my opinion, humble opinion, maybe not so humble, that it's like, I feel that they can't do nearly as good a job as we can. And I think as independent agencies, we've got to have that self-belief. And if I could go to, to Jacques and Nicola, um, one of the key things that often we're asked about by independent agencies, what are, what are the challenges? And what are the, with regards to getting corporate clients? And what are the insights that you can offer? Sure, yeah. So, um... I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard, lonely road and everybody said it. Um, and I mean, oddly enough, I come from the multinational agency background. Um, I ran one of the big, big Havas agencies in, 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 in Indochina um, with 50 staff members. Um, even then, running as an MD, it's still, it's, it's still a lonely road. But um, I think at the end of the day, on the independent side, it's you work 10 times harder um, to, get that, to get that piece of business. Um, that relationship, again, is, 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 is critically important. Um, and I've seen it on, on the multinational agency side as well, where I've built relationships and I left the business and the relationship with the client service is just not that strong and it just kind of collapses. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, it's just, just it's very much around building, building relationships to get new business, um, whether it's digitally for now, um, whether it's through webinars, whether it's through um, picking up the phone if need be, or it's through an email campaign. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way we go about building, building new business at the moment. And then also providing the right content or content that relates back to our business at the end of the day. Um, so a lot of our posting would be around strategy, marketing strategy, brand strategy, um, consumer segmentation. Um, so yeah, so a lot of that content that, that, that we do put out there, and I mean, it's content that we've spoken to you guys about as well in terms of what do we put out there as well, um, really helps drive those, those, those relationships forward. Um, and at the end of the day, just help build that pipeline from getting in, get, getting the client interested or getting a possible brand interested right through to getting that, that, that brief, that RFP. Um, at the end of the day, and I mean, I'm sitting with sitting with one here that we submitted at 10 o'clock last night for Singapore on a, on a piece of new brand rebranding work that that that, that, that they're looking for, um, and it's purely because I reached out via LinkedIn most probably a couple of couple of weeks ago already. Um, didn't didn't know that this project was coming up, and then and then I read that this project was out, and then I messaged again the client to said, "Listen, I'd love to speak to you about this." sent us the link at the end of the day to get all the RFP details um, and we submitted last night. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's very much just keeping contact, I guess. Um, and, and, and providing the information and, and being a bit of a thought leader on, on specific topics. Um, if not as thought leader, at least provide the right, right information to people at the end of the day um, in terms of your posts, your content, all of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very hard. I mean, you get the cold shoulder quite often. Yep. Um, John, John alluded to that. Uh, we get we get ghosted quite a bit as well. And again, yeah, we're not we're, we're most probably not the priority at the end of the day. Um, until, you are, us, until, until you are, until you are, Jacques. And then they want the to the end of the day. That's for us, it is the priority. Uh, for, for, for a client, not so much. So, I mean, it's it, it, it's it's those things. It's um, yeah. Yeah, it's great to have Susan and Peter to bounce things off. You know, uh, we, we get stumped and stuck and going, oh my goodness, are we doing the right thing? What can we do? How do we yeah. do this? Um, how do we tackle going to get new business? Um, are our creds right? Are our, is our website correct? You know, even though it's 
good old days. But anyhow, yeah, you know, you, you have to go through things and just make sure that your, your brand is up to date kind of thing. So you can tell, you, if you don't look the part, how can you sell your part to anybody else? So that's where I'm coming from, where, you know, as the designer in it. Um, yeah. That's so <laughs> huge. I completely, completely agree. And it's actually not hard because, um, you know, a lot of agencies are so busy. They don't have time to look at their own brand. Mm. So, you know, it's not actually, once you really think about it and you land on that, that positioning that's right for you, it's not that hard to stand out. We say cobblers, yeah, yeah. cobblers have the worst shoes. <laughs> Something actually uh, along the lines of uh, holistically what we're talking about here, and John, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well in this particular subject. But one of our clients, because we learn a lot from our clients as much as, as the other way around, he said that he's, he gets his clients opportunistically. And what he wants to do working with us is to do it strategically as well. Opportunistic, fantastic. I sat next to this guy or I spoke to someone at a Zoom meeting or I worked with them 10 years ago and I sent them an email or a LinkedIn message. And as you said, Jacques, it's like it was the right time, the right place. You wouldn't have had that opportunity had you not strategically focused on LinkedIn and, and, reach, and reached out to people. So I think most agencies, and certainly we've gone down that path ourselves, have said, okay, great this has been opportunistic, we know somebody, but if you can do that combined with strategic prospecting, you make a fortune. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, you, it is, there is a, certainly a big strategic component for me, but, but the big thing for me about um, what you guys have helped me with is, is really bringing a solid structured approach to how um, I do it. And, and I don't think my parents would ever call me the most disciplined person that they've ever met in their life. Um, so it's certainly something that I need um, a lot of help with. Um, and, it's, and it's, as Jacques said, you know, um, so my primary, primary way in which I engage um, is via LinkedIn. Um, and the structured approach that I've, t I've started to take is firstly, dedicating time to growing my, my LinkedIn connection base because they represent the eyes of the people that I get to speak to, even though I may not engage them. Um, they are the people that would then be the recipients, if you will, of my uh, thought leadership, which is then the, the second piece of, you know, so that's where you, you're posting content on LinkedIn that's useful, that you're engaging with other people and um, having an opinion on certain things and all of those things pop up. Um, and what that does is, is using that structured approach. And so what I mean is, is literally I've booked out days in my calendar uh, or times in my calendar every day of the week to do these things, to do these activities, um, is, is it builds a muscle memory um, of, of someone um, who does then get to, who, see, who sees your post, but maybe doesn't always interact with them, but sees them until that opportunistic moment comes around where they're going, you know, maybe we're in the market to do a rebrand. Um, now, who would we engage? And then I think, well, actually, I remember there was, someone on my LinkedIn feed that said that they are very good at this or had an opinion, let's, let's engage with them. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, so really, really, <laughs> it, it certainly is about uh, a structure, but I mean, it's certainly about strategy, but it's, for me, it's, it's really been about the structure and, and being disciplined and being consistent with it. And I guess that's one of the key things we talk about with all our clients. And sorry, Susan, I feel I'm asking too many questions. Um, <laughs> is, uh, is what happens when you get busy. So we all get, this is, this is we're, we're talk to our clients say, we're gonna be bedeviled by your success. Cause this is what happened, has happened to Susan and I in our agencies and it, it happens to all agencies. You do all this business development work, you get the clients and you stop doing business development because you're doing the work and you're making money and life is good. And then six months, 12 months later, it's like, heck, I've got no prospects. Now what? Yeah. What, are your, what do the panel think about that? What are the, what's the solution? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> you're, you're absolutely right. So, I mean, this is something that you, we've spoken about and I think, I think, um, look, it, it's, I'm very protective of the little village brand. Um, you know, I'm certainly not a micromanager. I don't believe I am, but I do like things done a certain way. Um, so I think what I've been going through, I'm probably newer to the agency accelerators process than perhaps the other members of the panel here, but I've been sort of working out how I take the essence of what you you guys are coaching me on and giving it that little village flavor, which is 100% your intention. Um, there's obviously going to come a point where we get busier and busier, and we are. We've actually been really, really busy the past three to six months. 
we're going to get busier and yes i'm going to have to let the reins go a little bit on that but hopefully by then i'll we'll have some some templates and some processes in place that i can hand it over to perhaps one of our account directors or one of our you know one of our team members so yeah it's not not, not an easy answer it really depends on how you run your agency but you have you have to commit to it and you have to keep it up i spend about an hour and a half a day on the agency accelerators at the moment and i just whether it's nine o'clock at night or eight in the morning i just make it happen so that's, I think that's a commitment i've made <laughs> what was that sorry Nicole? I think we're in the same kind of boat with that also. Yeah. I don't want to let go of it. You know, just, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think you, you also, um, Jacques and Nicola, have been quite consistent in your outreach now, isn't it, with the, with the type of structure around, you know, reaching out and, and moving forward with re really, we, as we say, creating conversations. That's what, that's what you want to do. That creates the catch, really, is the more conversations you can have going, the more ability and opportunity comes up. Like, as you said earlier, that... Um, you know, you reached out to someone and suddenly they had a project that you didn't know about, you know, but yeah. consistently reaching out. So I guess um, going forward, if you're, if you're getting busy, uh, really some of our clients have used virtual assistants. That's another one that, you know, we've chatted before about if they're, you know, if they're really getting busy. But uh, I think otherwise it really it depends. I mean, how long, how much effort do you think it needs to be put in? Do you think, Jacques and Nicola? I mean, how much do you do it daily? Are you doing it every day a little bit? Um, I do, I do, I do most of it, if not all of it. So, and, and, and it's done on a daily basis. Um, on a daily basis, I'm either reaching out to, to people via LinkedIn or via email or reaching out to connections that I've made over the last, especially five years in Southeast Asia. Um, so I, I kind of work at it on a daily basis, um, to kind of get into these opportunities as well. Um, so yeah, so it's, it, it, and, and it takes a lot of your time at the end of the day. Um, we haven't reached the point where, where, it's, where we've picked up so much business that I can't do it anymore. Um, and it, it, it will be still quite a while because I, I can't let go of it. Um, You're a control freak, John. <laughs> I, I, I learned from Nicola at the end of the day. And I mean, Sorry. Because Nicola's, Nicola's a control freak between the two of us and um, it's kind of started rubbing off on me. So it's not something I'll let go very quickly or very soon or very easily. Um, but I guess, it, again, it comes back to, to what I said earlier. I mean, as, as, as an independent, um, we work 10 times harder and we do 10 times more than you would find in a multinational agency, um, purely because I've worked in them and I've seen how they've run and I've run my own. Um, I've seen people who walk out at five o'clock where we're still sitting at 10, 9, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night and I'm still sending RFPs out. Um, for, 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 for a brand that's issued an RFP. Um, so yeah, you don't, you don't find that. Um, we, work, we work a lot harder for, what we, for, 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 for our clients at the end of the day. I see um, that. I like what, uh, what John said earlier, that uh, the rock stars come in. So there you are, you're all rock stars. So that's why. Because <laughs> yeah, we never leave. <laughs> just, we're, we're still there at the end of the day. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm showing my age terribly by quoting um, the Eagles with Hotel California is like, you can check out any time, but you can never leave. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, we've yeah. actually, uh, actually could, if um, we could have the, the screen back, please, Darren, because obviously we're running, running out of time and we've got lots and lots of questions to get through. So if we could go to just summing up the key points from uh, what we discussed, from what we discussed here. So I think in summary, and as I say, we'll get back to the, the panelists, the important people, but certainly COVID has changed the market's, the market's expectations and needs in favour of independent agencies. And I know one of the questions was I mean, how, how um, viable that is. But I think we'll, we can certainly agree that um, the era of fancy agency offices is over, particularly where it's locked down. It's like it doesn't matter how fancy your office is, no one's necessarily going to go there. What we've found from our clients and our research is that clients are still spending money. I know a lot of people are saying, oh, COVID, and everyone's skeptical and everyone's too nervous to make a decision. It's, you know what, it is harder. There's no doubt about that. But it's like the business is still out there to be had. And I think a key point we, we discuss with our clients, everyone wants to get the, the big 10 million, 5 million, $500,000 piece of business. But let's start with a $20,000 or $30,000 piece of business from a corporate. And then in a year's time, that could be the $500,000 or $5 million piece of business. And that's what we found with, with the clients that we've been talking about. And 
an integrated and always on business development program is the only way to consistently get new and larger clients. It's like, as I say, we all get busy and we drop the ball. And as I say, we've got that experience ourselves. But if you can move past that and have it an embedded and integrated business development program within your agency, that's the best way you're absolutely going to ensure that you have stability, which is a word that often is not associated with agencies, but you can certainly have stability um, with, uh, with, with your business when you do have that consistent program. And finally, it's, it's important to remember, particularly with larger clients, they're risk averse. If they, were risk, if, they, if they were risk takers, they'd be doing what all of us are doing. They'd be having their own agencies, their own companies. They are risk averse. So they are attracted to thought leaders, which is why we always say to our clients, you need to really build your thought leadership credentials because that's the way you're absolutely going to get people who are saying, well, Jacques and Nicola and John and Carolyn, they, they, it's a far less risky proposition to work with them because I've seen the work they do on LinkedIn. I get their emails. I see their blog posts that they've written and they are, they're gurus. They're rock stars to use John's, John's expression. So I think they're the key points that we, we take from a lot of what we do. So Susan, over to you for the next slide, please, Darren. So, so really for your business to kickstart your business development program, we really want to help you, basically we want to help you. So what we do is we have the program which we have offered our clients and as you heard, it does help them move the needle and give you a structured program. So what we're offering is lifetime support for a one-off payment of 9,800 Australian dollars. However, Darren has uh, provided uh, the opportunity to a, give us a special offer, allow us to give you a special offer. So instead of 9,800, we are actually going to offer the program for the next 14 days only for 6,800. And that is, um, as we said, a lifetime support, being part of a structured program, being uh, providing the mentoring that I think a lot of agencies need and the mindset to get you through that push to really win those corporate clients. Next slide, please, Darren. So if you would like to chat with us about your opportunities, then just go to theagencyaccelerators.com forward slash trinity dash P3 forward slash. And we'd love to chat with you. So I think we can go to Q&A. There's quite a few, I think. Yes, there is. Um, in fact, uh, it's been terrific, uh, guys. Great information. Um, we'll start with a question from James. He asked this quite early, and you may have, have, in fact, you did cover it, but it'd be worth just restating it. What proportion of owner CEO time should be allocated to growing the business versus managing it? Give us some numbers. Give us a percentage. What, why don't we go with the panelists? As I say, we have, we have some thoughts, but obviously, Jacques and Nicola, what do you think? Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a hard one to answer and it's, and it, and it, and it's, it's very specific to, 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 to kind of the, to, I guess, also the busyness of your business in any case. Um, but like I said, I mean, I spend, I've, I, I spend most probably every day, a good part of my day on new business, um, purely because I don't run a big multinational agency anymore where I don't need to be operationally involved so much. Um, the people we... The people we work with, um, from our strategy directors to our uh, creatives to to Nicholas, Simon, they're all senior people. They've done, they've they've been doing what they're doing for the last 15, 20 years, so they can kind of be left to do what they need to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I must probably spend a good, good, good at least almost half a day on 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 on, on new business, and that's from finding content to to post to putting together email newsletters to yeah. Um, I, I must probably spend half my day every day just on just on that. And Carolyn, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd back Jack up on that. I think um, you know, and look, I would say it gets it gets easier as you go. So as I said, five the five past the past five years for Little Village has just flown. And right back at the beginning, there was no way I could have spent that amount of time on the business as opposed to in the business because I was having to do so much more. But with employees and and more of a team. Um, you know, it's easier now. So I would, yeah, I would say, you know, look, I say one to one to one and a half hours set time, but it probably ends up being about half a day when you include all of the follow-ups and the content and you know, everything that we do. So look, you've just got to find your groove and what works really well for you and what you can manage. Uh, but it is, it is out of hours stuff. 
<laughs> Definitely. And yeah, John? and I can I can I can back that up. I mean, I, I, certainly the most part is is really on business development, and it never goes away. But I think the important piece to remember, and I think that's what John was saying earlier, is where previously you were maybe as an employee, perhaps if you would come from agency or uh, worked in a corporate world, you'd maybe be looking at eight hours a day. Whereas now, if you're running your own agency or own business, it's 16 hours a day or something like that. So, so the scope of, of the number of hours that you have to put in, that you divide up between running the business and building the profile of the business, sure, they, it, it's, it's fluid and it moves between uh, different projects and things like that. But certainly, you'll find yourself dedicating a larger portion of your 24 hours um, into making this work. And, and you do. Um, you do make it work. It's just more dedication. And, and can, I, can I just uh, add a point to that? And that's obviously we're very aware of that with our clients. And we're saying what we should be doing with our clients, and we're obviously mainly working with owners, is to say, okay, initially at least, it's the you have to do what you're doing, is to set it up the tonality, messaging, get everything up and running. But the whole idea, the whole premise behind this is that it should and can and should be run by more junior people once the program is up and running. Now, I know obviously the bigger agencies have senior business development people, but the way the program can run with what we're talking about, it can be run by juniors or as Susan said, virtual assistants. Okay. Um, we'll probably have to keep the answers a bit shorter because we've Sorry. got quite a few to get through. The next one is, what's the process of getting into the RFP rosters, or getting onto RFP rosters for large organisations? Who would like to take that? This maybe have one person answer per question. So that was my fault, Darren, I apologise. <laughs> <laughs> We're just okay. running out of time. Yep. Yes. So have a, do well, I don't want to answer because I actually have that question myself. So I'm keen to hear what the answer <laughs> is. <laughs> okay. Jack, Nicola? Let, you, let, you have let, let me jump in. Um, so yeah, to get onto an RFP roster, um, I don't think we've we, 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 we've cracked it to be on a consistent RFP roster, um, but it's it's really just keeping contact with the marketing department, your marketing directors, your CMOs, because um, when something comes up and they do do pitch out and it goes to um, procurement at the end of the day, there's normally a list of these are the guys I want to to kind of pitch on on, on a specific project at the end of the day. Um, if you do, if you can find the right procurement people that deal with marketing, um, production, procurement, um, they're good to keep contact with as well um, because they do sometimes have a bit of leeway to also decide it, who, who additionally goes onto that list. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, 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 I don't think we're, we're, we're on a consistent pitching roster at, in, in, in any way, form or shape at the moment. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it, it, it's very ad hoc, but... Yeah, it's, it's just kind of keeping in contact with, with, with the senior people. And if you can get into the procurement department and build a bit of a relationship there, that, 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 that would go a long way at the end of the day. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next one is, it's likely a safer decision for a corporate decision maker to buy from a larger corporate supplier. So ideas on how to overcome the perception that bigger is better. Carolyn, this has got your question all written all over it. <laughs> Oh, look, it, it, you know, I, I think as we've, as a lot of us have, have referred to today and sort of hinted at today, I think we all have to work so much harder as independent agencies. Um, but that's also not hard. Um, you know, I just, I always try to look at what other agencies aren't doing, particularly if you're on, you know, if you're, on, you're a roster agency. And I, I just don't do what the other agencies are or vice versa. So, you know, that might mean that, you know, it's a little bit tricky, obviously, with COVID, but I, I am at the client's office at short notice three days a week because they want my opinion on something. Um, you know, I, I think that, oh, so I sort of have to, I think, sometimes I think some of this is probably done automatically now by me because I'm so used to doing it. But it's, yeah, I, I think, you know, just, you've just got to sort of persist really and show that value and just show that extra care. And, you know, if, if it is going to make a difference that you actually show up at the client's office or, you know, you, you just take the extra care to, to do stuff and prove yourself, it really does pay off. And I think over time you can really build and grow those relationships too. Um, yeah. Well, picking up on something Peter said uh, earlier, which is we've noticed uh, 12 months ago, 
that uh, large corporates are now uh, much more open to independent agencies. And that's, that trend has just accelerated during this, uh, the pandemic. But I think there's almost a shift to wanting more nimble, more agile, more on the ground and more management on the ground rather than this process of having to get approval from you know, somewhere overseas, which is not here. So I think that's uh, such a, um, an important trend that people should be aware of. Um, when you're talking to corporates, because it's a trade-off in a way that uh, they're getting all those benefits and maybe you're not as big, but do you need big? Okay. Mm. And they, you can Sorry. be faster. Absolutely. No, agree. Okay. Uh, what is your views on doing uh, pitching and I get for work, and that is doing um, speculative creative work for no money? <laughs> John Chan, John Chan, unmute. We need to hear from you. Yeah, so I, I think we probably have a, a counter view to what the industry says, uh, and I understand the views of, of of agencies that go, you know, don't undervalue um, the work that you do. Um, you know, you need to back yourself and your product, um, and therefore it has value. And therefore, if the client really values you, you will do that. I think for my mindset, certainly on this side, has been, you know, we we are hungry for a chance um, to prove that what we can do is good and it's as big as all the big boys, um, even though we're one of the small boys. And one of those ways to do that is actually to get an opportunity to prove what you do. Um, and that may very well be a brief that goes, there may not be any work that comes out of this. And it means that we will put in the hours in the background with the creative team um, to actually work in this. And yes, there's no obligation that there will be, but it is an opportunity for, for us to go look at what we can do. You know, look at the power of our creative, look at the power of how we understood your brand and what we can do. And, you know, I've seen these trends in, in the job market before where highly regarded graduates would come out of uni um, and couldn't find a job because they need work experience. Well, how do you get work experience? Well, someone needs to hire you. So what do they do? They work for free. They work for free, not, not forever, um, indefinitely, but they get a chance to build a case study of their own life um, so that they can prove that they actually can do what they're doing. So for me, I, we absolutely are in that boat where we go, we want to prove, prove ourselves and we'll do whatever it takes to prove ourselves because we, we just want a chance. Um, and if you don't give us a chance, then we'll try and fashion our own chance. And that typically goes against what the industry wants to do, which is, again, to pitch for free and things like that. Um, unfortunately, uh, panel, we've run out of time. There's more questions. So I'll ask, uh, I'll forward those through to you, uh, if you'd be willing to respond in writing so that we can share that with, uh, sure. with everyone that's joined today. Is everyone uh, open to that? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Terrific. Well, look, yep. I just, I, uh, just to wrap up, I just want to thank, first of all, Susan and Peter for uh, putting today together and to Carolyn, John, Nicola and Jacques for uh, joining, especially very early in the morning. Yep. Um, <laughs> for, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, just by way of wrap up, I'll just go back to sharing the information. Look, uh, we've been recording today and so you'll be able to get the uh, recording um, if you, uh, it'll be available soon. An email will come out in the next 24 hours. Make sure you have subscribed to trinityp3.com forward slash subscribe because that's the way to keep uh, up to date with everything that's going on with uh, Trinity P3, including uh, in the next three weeks, we've got uh, a weekly uh, webinar at this time, Going Beyond Purpose to Relevance is next week. Uh, innovating broadcast production during a global pandemic, and then reducing carbon pollution in marketing communications is uh, week three. So check all that out at trinityp3.com forward slash business hyphen events. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can get find uh, more information here at uh, either from our blog uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook. We're in Sydney, Singapore, London, New York, and Zurich. And I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. Have a great day.